It is Friday, November 17th, 2023. This is a special edition of football today. Why? Because Bobby Skinner is off to watch his sister get married this weekend. So in his place, his talking Giants buddy, Justin Panic. I am Chris Rose, producer Mikey along for the ride as well. I have a hard time seeing you and not looking at you as a blitzball umpire. I have mm. to be honest. Is this the first time you're seeing me without sunglasses on indoors? I think, you know what, maybe you can uh, put on a pair of Shady Rays or something just to make us all feel better, maybe make me feel a little bit more at home. Oh, I would love that. We'll love that. But Chris, no, I'm, I'm really, I'm really glad to join you. I mean, this is kind of even just like a cool moment for me. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to gas you up a little bit where you know, oh, you're, God. you're kind of a legend in, in what you do. So the fact that, you know, we're kind of here talking ball together, uh, it's kind of a, kind of a cool moment for, for a young guy like me. So I, I'm ready to, ready to talk some football on a Friday. I do appreciate it. I don't take it lightly. Uh, a lot of people at the company have said that. And the translation is, Jesus, you're old as shit. So thank you. I appreciate it. I understand it. I respect it. So let's do this. Let's start off with Thursday night, which was a bruising effort in the AFC North. Baltimore ends up winning by two touchdowns. They will remain atop the division no matter what happens this weekend in the game between the Steelers and the Browns. But I think the bigger news was the number of injuries suffered, right? Mark Andrews, it sounds like he's done for the year with an ankle. And then we're unknown on Joe Burrow. After the game, head coach Zach Taylor said it's a sprained wrist. He is getting an MRI. As of the taping of this show, we don't know how long he will be out, if he misses any time whatsoever. But a big picture here. The Bengals are now five and five and out of the playoff chase as they sit today. Is their season done? Joe Burrow said on the sideline that he kind of felt like a pop. So that's that's never that's never fun. But depending on how long Burrow's out, it kind of does, right? Even if it's for like a three game stretch where let's just say they don't win any of those games, it kind of does because I feel like the Bengals are one of the most QB dependent teams in the league, which isn't a bad thing because I feel like the Chargers, uh, the Bills, they fall in the same boat where they just rely on these really elite quarterbacks to make some really elite throws and read these defenses where like, hey, I think your Browns are a little bit more QB friendly. I think the 49ers are a little bit more QB friendly where there's more like schematic stuff happening that can kind of manufacture stuff, right? But seeing the Bengals when Burrow was right, I think that over the last month, you're starting to talk Super Bowl contenders again. And then seeing the Bengals when Burrow was obviously hurt in the calf at the start of the season, it was one of the worst offenses in the league. So let's just say this Burrow injury is, even if it's like a two- to three-week injury, we're at the point of the year where every single win and loss means so much. Bengals could be done for. So I'm not going to sit here and play doctor. I hate it when people do that and say, if it's this, if it's that, we'll just wait. And they'll tell us probably later today, um, what they're looking at, and he might even need a little more time. Of course, the good news for him is that he doesn't play for another week and a half, mm. but their buy has come and gone, so he doesn't have that built in. As far as the division goes, that's over, okay? They've lost both games to the Ravens. They're three games back there. That's history. They're 0-3 in the division. They are 1-5 and in conference. The only good thing is they're champions of the NFC West. That's it. That's all they got riding for them. Uh, that is – that. That's a makeup thing, by the way. That's not real. They're not going to be the champions of the NFC West. We didn't, you know, realign football divisions. So I look at it this way is there's going to be so many tiebreakers that come into effect. Have they totally screwed themselves with a lack of wins in the conference? I think they have. Yeah. And I, I think they have. Yeah, I mean, there's so many teams, you know, towards the bottom of this wild card, um, at the top of the wild card, at the bottom of the wild card that are so tight. I mean, according to, according to NFL.com right now in the, the playoff picture, it's Colts and the Raiders that are ahead of them in, in, in tiebreakers. Right. Which is which is really which is really crazy. That's why even if it's for, even if it's for a one two three game stretch, which you know that doesn't take the Bengals out of it, but that's why you know those three games, two games hypothetically, if if Joe Burrow misses it, that's why it means so much. Yeah, and now, you know, we saw really the most substantial playing time of Jake Browning's NFL career, even though he has been out of college football since 2019. You know, might he be okay? Sure, he could be. Is he going to be close to Joe Burrow? No. I mean, if he's 70% of Joe Burrow, I think the Bengals would swoop that up in a minute. You talked about them being a quarterback-dependent team. They are the worst rushing team in the NFL. 
They are the worst. Their offensive line, they're okay at pass protection. They're not a good running team, and they don't stay committed to it. Wow. And I think it's been a major, major mistake in Zach Taylor's coaching ability over the last few years because now they don't have that to lean on. And their defense, while um, opportunistic at times and certainly solid, and particularly when they get to the playoffs, they usually play at another yeah. level, um, they're not – an upper echelon defense. I'm talking, I'm talking about top five where you can have subpar or average quarterback play and feel like you're in a lot of games. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Absolutely. All right. Let's move on to the other AFC North battle that is happening this weekend in Cleveland. It's six and three Steelers coming to town, six and three Browns, who of course are now with out Deshaun Watson. He's having shoulder surgery next week. So DTR is the starter moving forward. I'll ask the same question about the Browns that I just asked of the Bengals. Is it over? I say no. Now, I'm going to give my points. You're a Browns fan, so I definitely want to hear your, your perspective on this. I say no, because here's what it's going to come down to with DTR and the Browns. Avoiding third and long. I kind of rewatched some plays of uh, DTR's first start and first game against the Ravens. Can't tell you the amount of third and sixes that DTR faced. Now, that's not necessarily third and long, but clearly, that, that's just not an area where you, I guess you really want to be relying on DTR to consistently, consistently convert, convert, convert. A lot of third and sixes. Avoiding third and long, avoiding sacks, avoiding negative plays, staying on schedule. That is what this Browns offense is going to need to do. And I think the fact that DTR is mobile and he's going to give the Browns a chance at avoiding negative plays on a consistent basis. Did have three interceptions in that game versus the Ravens. Um, but... My whole point, and they they actually, the the Browns just had Joe Flacco in for a workout, which I think at this point in the game, when you're hosting a quarterback in for a workout, that may more than likely mean that they are actually interested in signing him and looking for him. If you're going to sign Joe, uh, Joe Flacco, fine. I wouldn't even start Joe Flacco or any QB who is not mobile because that is what DTR brings to the table. At least a little bit of a mobile factor where he can get you a 15 plus yard run on a QB scramble or even a design QB run and kind of keep a play alive that way versus a non-mobile quarterback like a Joe Flacco just will not bring you that element. So that's how I actually think that the Browns offense can stay alive. And I put alive in quotes because it's already been really bad so far this year. So I look at the Browns a little bit like how I looked at the Niners um, a year ago, right? Excellent defense, um, have other guys that can get the job done, and they're turning to a quarterback that had a lot of college experience but was drafted way down in the draft, right? Brock Purdy, obviously Mr. Irrelevant, but we didn't know much about him when he got there other than he had started a shitload of games at Iowa State. Same thing with DTR, who is littered all over the UCLA record book and was a five-year starter out there in Westwood. So can, the question is, not can DTR give the Browns what they what Deshaun Watson gave them last week and that come from behind win in Baltimore, can he give the Browns what Brock Purdy gave the Niners a year ago? Now, they don't have exactly the same skill sets, but there are some areas where DTR, I think, is better than Purdy, and there are some areas where Purdy is better than DTR. But the point is, is that now we're like, oh, my God, Brock Purdy, he's really good. He can get them to the Super Bowl. A year ago, we were like, oh, my God, are the Niners screwed? And they weren't. In fact, I think a lot of people feel like they could have won that game in Philadelphia had he not ripped up his elbow. Right. So am I going to compare it exactly that way? No. But if you look at the Browns' schedule down the stretch, they've got Pittsburgh. They still have – they have to finish the season at Cincinnati. They got a tough two-game road trip, like at Denver next week. Three weeks ago, you would have laughed at that game. Not anymore. Then they're at the Rams. They still have to host Jacksonville. Uh, they still have to host Chicago. So there's like, if they can go four and four and get to 10 and seven, you're talking about a playoff team. I don't think the division, though, is much in play. Chris, that's a doable schedule, though. Yeah, it is. It's, it it's, is. It's a, you know, it's so many AFC teams are, are, are really tough. You know, e even a team like the Jets that's not going to make the playoffs, they have the Jets week 17 uh, on a Thursday night game. Like, e that's that's a tough game, but still it's a game that you can envision totally. the Browns winning. And it's because they're going to need, it's going to have to come down to the defense. It's going to have to come down to the defense. Like, we're, we're talking quarterback, quarterback, and what DTR can do. It's going to have to come down to a defense that's been historically really good, that has a lot of fun players on it. 
Um, and it's also going to have to come down to how Kevin Stefanski, who I view as a very, very good coach and a run game at times that is more efficient. It's really tough for a running game to be more efficient on like an EPA basis than a, th- than a passing game. But there are times, and the Browns are one of those exceptions, where a running game is more efficient than their, than yep. their passing game. And Kevin Stefanski is one of those minds that can... You know, we can get those explosive running plays in multiple different ways. Um, you know, Amari Cooper and, and Elijah Moore. I'm looking for Njoku to step up, finally be, you know, maybe that tight end that we've wanted him to be on a lot of these different teams, step up and be this athletic tight end or even a security blanket for DTR on third down. So it's almost going to have to be so much more than just the quarterback that's going to need to step up here in Deshaun Watson's absence. Yeah, and last week, the Browns were down to their fourth and fifth offensive tackles. We're not sure if it's going to be that way again or if Dewan Jones will return to play. Mm-hmm. But let's remember one thing. It was a game two years ago. It was Big Ben's final home game, that Monday night football, where T.J. Watt had like four or four and a half sacks against James Hudson, who might be pressed into duty yet again this week. That's just something to keep your eye on because that's the part of the game that scares me as a Browns fan is a guy like Watt or Highsmith who both ruined that Monday night game earlier this year uh, against Cleveland, that they could do the same against DTR. But we'll see. Should be a fascinating, like, 17-13 game. All right. Are you more interested to see if Josh Dobbs's magic carpet ride can continue in a successful manner Sunday night out in Denver, or if Antonio Pierce can improve to 3-0 and as the interim coach of the silver and black when they travel to Miami? I mean, Josh Dobbs, one hundred percent, right? I mean, this this is a guy that's j- just the story of Josh Dobbs. Forget about what he, what he's doing as as a quarterback, which I think is you know not not turning over the ball, not taking sacks. He's adding you know an element of mobility, but just the the story, the the underdog story of, of Josh Dobbs heading into a team that I actually think in a weaker NFC, like I I I think the NFC playoff picture as it is comprised right now. I think that is the NFC playoff picture. Now, there's seeding that's still to be decided, but I think those teams that you have in the playoffs right now in the NFC, I think those are the teams, maybe with an NFC South, you know, a a different division winner besides the Saints. So I'm 100% more interested in Josh Dobbs, kind of just like rooting for that underdog story. Now, obviously, Antonio Pierce and the Las Vegas Raiders are an underdog story as well, but they don't have my attention quite so yet because... When you beat both New York teams who have two of the worst offenses in football, right. th- that's uh, if the Raiders even cover or if they even have a competitive game against Miami, who's known to beat up on these bad teams, then I'll get a little bit more interested in that. I just view Josh Dobbs and the Vikings as a little bit more legit right now. Yeah, I'm not really interested in that Miami Raiders game. I don't think it'll be close. As I said earlier, with the Bengals being the champion, the fictitious champion of the NFC West, same thing that you know, the Raiders are the best team out of New York. So that that's nothing. Now, this Sunday night game in Denver has all of a sudden become fascinating based on what the Broncos did Monday night in Buffalo. This defense, and I don't know if people have really paid attention to this because all they think about is that 70 spot they gave up early in the season to fall to 0-3 when they lost to Miami. Since week seven, they're the best defense in terms of points per game. They're giving up 16 points per game. Vance Joseph, to his credit, has totally changed things around. Russell Wilson has significantly improved from last year, right? I mean, we all thought that Sean Payton was brought in basically to revamp Russell Wilson. Mission accomplished. Now, I don't know. Maybe they gave the rest of the AFC too much of a head start to to play catch up here. But I do expect them to win another game, to win maybe a fourth game in a row this weekend, because I think at some point, as great as the Josh Dobbs stories have been, at some point it's going to revert back to the mean. I mean, it is. I love Josh Dobbs. I think he's a great kid. I've interviewed him a bunch um, since he's been in camp the last couple of years with the Browns. He's still Josh Dobbs. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it. Now it, it's. I I love Aiden O'Connell as a coach, and I think the more that maybe he you can mean, add. You mean Kevin O'Connell? Kevin O'Connell. Excuse me. Ke- Kevin. You o- hate Aiden O'Connell's mustache. Yeah. Yeah. I have Aiden O'Connell on the brain just beat the crap out of my Giants two weeks ago. Um, Kevin O'Connell, I love Kevin O'Connell as a coach. And yeah. I and I think you saw that immediately with the way that Josh Dobbs was able to come in. It's like, all right, we're going to give you a game plan. We're going to give you an approach. Um, you're, you're working on the cadence on the sideline. I mean, I, I think that that's why this has been able to, to work. Um, so I think the more that O'Connell can add to Dobbs' play,
Okay, good. Good. Nice tease work on your part. Uh, by the way, when Kirk Cousins went down for the year with an Achilles and you saw this on the Sunday night slate, you're like, oh, my God, NBC better tr- try and figure out a way to flex out of this game. But all of a sudden, it's one of the most, if not the most intriguing game of the weekend. So there you go. Good job, everybody. Before we get back to the show, we got to talk about DraftKings. The weather might be cooling down, but the action on the field, it's staying hot. And today we've teamed up with DraftKings, an official partner of the NFL, to get you closer to the action right now. New customers who bet just $5 get $150 in bonus bets instantly. It's that easy. So download the DraftKings app now and use promo code Football today, all one word. If you're a fan of multiple teams and want to bet on on them all, combine multiple bets together for a shot at an even bigger payout. And if sports betting is not available in your state, not to worry. You could still join in on all the fun with DraftKings Daily Fantasy Sports. Download the DraftKings Sportsbook app now. New customers who use promo code FOOTBALL today, you can bet $5 on any wager and get $150 in bonus bets instantly. That's promo code FOOTBALL today, only at the DraftKings Sportsbook. You'll be glad you did. A uh, couple of coaches are in the crosshairs, in our opinion. Chargers head coach Brandon Staley says he's going to continue to be calling the plays for the defense as the Chargers are out at Lambeau Field this weekend. Ken Dorsey, of course, fired earlier this week as the offensive coordinator for the Buffalo Bills. Joe Brady will be calling the plays against the New York Jets. Which coaching staff, in your opinion, is under more pressure? Now, this is where I'm going to throw you for a loop because I think the easy answer is Brandon Staley, like 100%. But I am way more fascinated with the Bills situation that they have going on right now. Because I, 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 I think there's a... Chris, do, do you think there's a foregone conclusion? Maybe even if the Chargers make the playoffs, but if the, let's just say they miss the playoffs, I think they're on the outside looking in right now. If they miss the playoffs, Brandon Staley's gone, right? Yeah, to me, part of the reason I pose this question is if they lose at a subpar Green Bay... Oh. Is he gone after this week? That's, I can see it. That's the big question to me because he he was brought – listen, when you bring in a defensive coach and you have him lead a team where you've got a young stallion at quarterback, you're running a risk, right? Yep. You damn well better make sure that you've got everything buttoned up on your defense. And it, it just and hasn't been a been. shit show. Yeah. Bottom of the league in passing yards allowed. I think second worst in terms of total yards per game allowed. And they have – it's not like it's a rebuilding defense. They have a ton of veterans on that side. I believe that they have spent the most money yep. on the defensive side of the football of any team in the NFL. So, dude, what, like, what are we, what's going on here? Again, and that's why that that situation, because it's been so talked about, like we know the Los Angeles Chargers, they 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 can't win a close game. And if it comes down to it and it's a close game, it's like Brandon Staley and, you know, whether it's even Herbert having questions of him in the fourth quarter too, or especially that defense, they've done nothing to prove to you that that is going to change. Where if it's a three-point game, one-score game, and, and, and at the end of the game, they've done nothing to prove to you that that is going to change and that you should trust them. But the Bills situation fascinates me more. So, yes, I Brandon Staley, there, there is more pressure uh, with uh-huh. him because his job is 100% on the line versus the Bills situation I think is a lot more nuanced. And I want to hear your, your take on this because I'm, I'm very much, uh, you know, I'm, I'm a stats guy and I'm, I'm looking at the Bills offense that, oh, my God, they're, they're scoring points. Josh Allen is having a, a really good year. Yeah, he's throwing interceptions, but he's still – Really efficient. He's not taking a lot of sacks. Uh, Josh Allen's one of the best quarterbacks in the NFL at avoiding sacks. I think Josh Allen is still Josh Allen, despite the interceptions. And, and as we know, you know, when offenses that are more explosive, sometimes being an explosive offense is going to come at the cost of turning the ball over a little bit. Obviously, you want to limit those interceptions as much as Josh Allen has been turning over the ball over. But also, there's been like tipped, there's been tipped interceptions too. There's been drop balls that that offense has had. So I look at it from an efficiency standpoint. I'm like, I, I don't, I don't know if Brandon Staley like needed to be fired, but I also understand it from a concept standpoint and a leadership. St- especially, I want to highlight maybe the leadership standpoint of is was Ken Dorsey a the leader 
that that offense needed. So I want to hear your thoughts on Ken Dorsey kind of getting the boot despite the Bills' offense being efficient. It felt like a scapegoat move, except that Sean McDermott just got a contract extension, I believe, this summer that takes him through 2027. Right. It reeked of desperation in terms of, well, I better fire that guy before I get shit canned. And I don't think that that's the way this is going to go. Like, if he hadn't received that extension, then I think I'd be a little worried overall about this coaching staff because right. they went like this, right? They took over. And they went this direction, and then they've kind of started to go on this arc instead. Um, when do you think that started? I mean, and I think this is this is the out that this regime, and this is with Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott, this is the right. out that they have of this year. When did it all start to go downhill? It all started to go downhill when they had that primetime game where they lost like four defensive starters in one night. That's really when it started to go downhill for the team that that defense just, the defense in the team has not been the same since they've lost, I think, like Daquan Jones, Matt Milano, since they lost all those guys. Like, it felt well, like all in the same game. Um, yeah, well, that's, so that was over in London. Yeah. That was, a, that, that was the London game. Yeah. And uh, it was actually the opposite of a primetime game. It was a, it was an only window game, but man, that was early. I can tell you that because I had to get up at 2 a.m. that day <laughs> to go host the pregame shows. But you're right. Um so, yeah, the, here's the thing, right? When you have a franchise quarterback, and we're always so quick to point at he's a franchise quarterback, you have to be elite regardless of the situation, meaning people say, well, Josh Allen doesn't have a great offensive line. He doesn't have a running game. He has receivers who are dropping passes, balls going through their hands and resulting in interceptions. They're losing a ton of guys. on the, Well, you know what? When you get paid that level and you're making up a certain part of the financial pie, you got to be great. You have to be. One of the things I wish that social media had been around for was the Brett Favre era. Because you're really not old. How old are you? I'm 25. Yeah, you're not old enough to, no. to remember when Favre really first became Favre and won three straight MVP awards. Dude, he would throw the ball to the other team like seven times a game, but they couldn't freaking catch it because it was thrown a gazillion miles an hour. So the game plan was defensively, listen, guys, he's going to throw it to you. You know it. It's just we got to catch it or he's going to beat us. And that's always what happened with Favre. Um, and I feel like when I see Josh Allen, it's a very similar structure. Now, to me – the difference is, is that Favre ended up getting the best defensive player in the league up at Lambeau in Reggie White. Mm -hmm. And he ended up having some other Hall of Famers that he played with as well. And he still made all these crazy things. Yeah. Like Josh Allen, to me, this is more of a, can a coach rein Josh Allen in enough so that you don't take away who he is but that he doesn't take away our ability to win games, right. particularly when we're missing a ton of defensive starters and don't have a running game. Right. So then that, that kind of leads back to that leadership thing where, where Ken Dor like you're, you're maybe Ken Dorsey didn't have the, maybe the, the same leadership or definitely, I mean, the same level of communication. I mean, I can tell you there, we, we have a, you know, Giants fan, you know, us being myself being a Giants fan, we have a lot right. of connections with bills people since, you know, we basically are the Buffalo bill South now. And I mean, I'll I'll tell you. I mean, they they definitely feel like the level of communication that Josh Allen had with Brian Dable and that chemistry that they had, it was not the same with Ken Dorsey. So you know, maybe Joe Brady can you know I, I don't want to say rekindle that same magic that Brian Dable had, but rein in Josh Allen a little bit and kind of get him back on track. But at the same, there's a ba it's a balance, man, where you don't want to make Josh Allen this check down Charlie. You want to still no. have an explosive offense. You won't be that. You know, you want to have an explosive offense and you want to let Josh Allen be Josh Allen, but you also don't want it to come at the expense of, you know, making a bad turnover at, at, at a bad time. So, you know, maybe, hey, that, I was like really wondering, like, is it is it a leadership thing? Is it a schematic thing? It can't be an efficiency thing because they're still scoring points and they're still doing good. Um, you know, so I think it really has to be, you know, can we get a leader in here that can communicate with Josh Allen to kind of rein him in and hone him in a little bit? All right, last one. Let's do this in a minute. Team out of the playoff picture right now, meaning they don't hold one of the seven spots in either conference. That'll be most fun to watch down the stretch. Teased it a little earlier. 
It's, I think it's the Denver Broncos. I think it's the Denver Broncos. I mean that that AFC is so fun right now with you know the the seat the seating and the teams. It, there's so much to be left to be decided towards the you know the the end part of this year, the second half of this year. Broncos last two defenses that they've played are the Chiefs and the Bills. Or the last two offenses that they've played are the yep. Chiefs and the Bills, and they really shut them down. Um, and look at the schedule that they have coming up. There's games coming up that they have an opportunity to shake up seating and earn tiebreakers themselves. It's not an easy schedule, but if they take care of business, we're talking about the Denver Broncos kind of climbing up that ladder. Um, Russell Wilson, I feel like doing what he's got to do. Um, I, you know, you said that he was kind of back earlier. I don't know if he's fully back, but I will no. say limiting the mistakes. And you saw this past week where he was playing the Bills really avoiding pressure and extending plays. And that's kind of the magic Russell Wilson that we saw at Seattle, being able to extend those plays and create explosives that way. It's one of the more dangerous things that a quarterback can do in the game of football. So I'm keeping my eye out on the Broncos. And you talked about their defense earlier, how they really did like a, you know, they really flipped a 180 from what they were doing earlier in the year. Um, I got the five and five Colts. I know you're like, <laughs> oh my God, they sound like one of the most boring teams in the league. However, until last week, where they won, I think, 10 to 6 over in Germany against the Patriots, that was the first time all year that they didn't score at least 20 points a game. Wow. The only team in the NFL that had scored at least 20 in every game. That's a crazy stat. Okay. Now they got it. They have a bye this weekend, so you don't have to sit through their game. Rest of the way Tampa, Tennessee, Cincinnati, Pittsburgh, Atlanta, Vegas, and Houston, whom they already beat. So. Just saying, keep your eye on Gardner Minshew. He's like a little bit like the uh, the current Jameis Winston. He'll keep his team and your team in the game. Just a team to keep your eye on down the stretch. You can say you heard it here first on football today. I love it. All right, enjoy your watching weekend. Uh, Giants, who do they have? Giants versus Commanders, 1 p.m. It's uh -oh. going to be a great game. Yeah, great. <laughs> enjoy that. Enjoy that. Uh, thanks for hanging out with me today. I, I appreciate it. Let Bobby enjoy his uh, family festivities. It was good. Good good work, man. Thank you, Chris. You got it. For producer Mike, he always does a bang-up job. Thank you very much. Continue to listen and take in the content of Talking Giants World. Panic Skinner, they do a great job. I am Chris Rose. We will see you Monday here on Football Today.